They make our lives more comfortable, more rewarding, and more secure. They are the magical machines that have brought us to the edge of a new frontier of limitless possibilities. But it is a frontier filled with dangers and demons of our own creation. In 1979, a power plant in southeast Pennsylvania revealed how close society can come to a nuclear nightmare. Now, inviting disaster, Three Mile Island, next on Modern Marvels. So often, uh, with these disasters, when I looked into them, the operator was left high and dry with that terrible feeling of being trapped in a machine running wild. And nothing in the manual could help them. There was no one available on the phone. The designers were not accessible. And time was ticking, this terrible feeling that um, this event is going to catch you. March 28th, 1979, 3.58 a.m. As it has for eons, the Susquehanna River continues this night on its ancient way through southeastern Pennsylvania. It glides through the state capital at Harrisburg. In the Capitol building, the graveyard shift is cleaning the governor's office for the coming workday. Only a few miles further south, the Susquehanna moves past the empty shops and silent streets of Middletown. Then, on to the village of Goldsboro, sleeping now across the river from the blinking lights of four 30-story towers. These enormous monoliths mark the site of the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. Perched on a sandbar in the river, the plant swills tons of the Susquehanna's cool water every hour. The water absorbs the enormous heat produced by 150 tons of uranium that lie buried in the heart of the plant's two nuclear reactors. In boilers seven stories high, still other pipes carrying more water absorb this heat and turn it into a quarter million pounds of pressurized steam a minute. The tremendous energy now trapped in this superheated steam moves on to a 500 ton turbine as long as a city block. The turbine uses the steam's energy to spin a generator that at last produces the final product of this very complicated process. Almost a billion watts of electricity. Once it has done its job, the steam transfers its scalding temperature off to more water, which in turn finally loses its heat, trickling down the giant cooling towers. Three men are on duty this night inside the control room of Unit 2, one of the plant's two generating units. They are responsible for over a thousand gauges, lights, meters, and switches that monitor the health of Unit 2. Tonight, repairs are being carried out. Workers are shooting compressed air into a pipe, trying to unclog a filter. They have done this before, but this time, things will be different. 4 a.m., what Ray Bradbury called the low ebb of the soul, late at night, often the time when accidents happen. Using compressed air to clean a filter is a routine maintenance technique. But tonight, a trace of water has worked its way back into the air system, and in an instant, the great machine senses its presence. Nothing at Three Mile Island will ever again be routine. Suddenly alarms started going off, um, the lights flashing. Uh, one person described the, the control board as lighting up like a Christmas tree. They didn't know what happened, they couldn't figure it out. The plant's computers react as though the water in the air system is a dangerous invader. Water in the line can lower critical air pressure to valves and pumps. The computers fight back by instantly shutting down those pumps. But this means that the all-important coolant is no longer relieving the reactor of its tremendous heat. And that caused the control operators to face situations that they had never encountered before and had never been covered in their training or in their procedures. With nowhere to discharge its tremendous heat, the pressure in the primary coolant system within the reactor begins to build. Sensing danger, the computer now orders cadmium rods to plunge into the reactor 
shutting down the chain reaction that is splitting millions of atoms. But even with the nuclear reaction turned off, intense heat and enormous pressure continue to increase. The heat and pressure can tear the system apart. A pressure-operated relief valve, known as a PORV, now opens to vent the pressure. All of this is normal precaution built into the system. What isn't normal is that the valve fails to reclose. It will now threaten this great machine with destruction. Even worse, the poor valve indicator light on the control console goes out, giving the operators the impression that the valve, having done its job, has now closed. But what the light was designed to do was simply say the control order had been sent. It had been sent, but not obeyed. Reactor coolant is what separates a safe reactor from a nuclear nightmare. Now, that precious coolant is gushing out of the stuck valve without anyone's knowledge. What is happening on Three Mile Island on this March night was never adequately planned for. The idea for building this remarkable machine had been born 20 years before and had grown in a swell of enthusiasm for what was then viewed as the perfect energy source. As far back as the 1950s and early 60s, Americans were told that nuclear power could produce electricity that was cheaper and cleaner than that made from oil or coal. Proponents boasted that atomic power plants could produce electricity so inexpensively that it would be too cheap to meter. Nuclear power's popularity increased even more when world events in 1973 signaled the end of inexpensive oil. In October of that year, the petroleum exporting countries shocked the world by drastically cutting back on petroleum sales. As they struggled to fill their gas tanks and worried about fuel for heat and electricity, most Americans agreed. The infant nuclear power industry needed to grow quickly. It created uh, a dynamic within the federal government and the nuclear industry of, hey, we've got to build more nuclear plants. These plants grew in size by leaps and bounds. They were subsidized by the federal government. It really looked like the sky was the limit. By 1974, there were 43 nuclear plants around the nation, with another 104 on the way. Work on the Three Mile Island plant was begun that same year. The managers of the new plant would be the Metropolitan Edison Company, known as MetEd. The company went to great lengths to reassure citizens living near Three Mile Island that the new technology was perfectly safe. The experts said, you never have to worry about an accident because we have backups to backups and there'll never be an accident. We were assured that an accident like TMI was quote unquote non-credible. It couldn't happen. But for all the promises of the past, the accident was happening and happening quickly. Unnoticed high up on the pressurizing tank of unit two, 1,000 pounds of radioactive steam and water a minute continued to pour out of the stuck relief valve. So now there was less and less coolant every minute, and it caused the instruments to go crazy, to lie to the operators. There are 2,000 instruments in the control room. Amazingly, none show how much coolant is in the reactor. The status of the reactor's all-important coolant is monitored indirectly by measuring the pressure inside the reactor. It's similar to showing how much water is in a tea kettle by measuring the pressure of the steam coming out. And what all these lights and gauges now show is a level of pressure in the system that says water is gradually filling the reactor's pressure tank. If allowed to fill to the top, the water will finally have nowhere to expand and will burst the critical coolant system like an overinflated balloon. Reactor operators call the condition going solid and have been taught never to allow it to happen. The pressure gauges suggest the water is continuing to rise 200, 300, 350 inches. The manual says 400 inches is the maximum. That pressurizer was shown to be full of water when in fact it was actually losing water. It was a false indication of where the level was. But they responded the way their procedures and training had taught them was to deal with that problem. 
5 a.m. The control room begins to fill with people all trying to bring the worsening situation under control. But the system is not behaving according to the book. With the pressure so high, there should be too much, not too little water covering the core. Instead, the reactor is getting hotter and hotter. The problem is that no one knows about the coolant gushing out of the valve. They have their instrument panel, but because of the damage, they begin to feel they couldn't trust the readings that they were getting on the instruments. As the reactor coolant heats up, more of the liquid is turning to steam. The giant pumps that move 2,000 gallons of water a minute are not designed to handle the steam. They start to violently shake and vibrate. If they tear themselves apart, the plant is doomed. An unheard of decision is made. The control room supervisor will gamble. He orders reactor pumps turned off. They did exactly the wrong thing, but they thought they had never been trained for this situation. They thought it was a way to keep the reactor from, quote, going solid. So they were fooled. They began letting coolant out. The men in the control room now mistakenly think that the situation is improving. It is not. With the pumps off, the core is being uncovered and its temperature is over 2,000 degrees and rising. When the core reaches 5,000 degrees, it will melt, becoming a molten mass, a metallic lava that will burn through the 8-inch thick steel containment vessel. Once out of the plant, it will scorch into the earth itself. What happens next could become an unrivaled technological disaster. When it reaches the water table, it will immediately turn to steam, boiling steam. There will be geysers of radioactivity steam shooting up in parking lots and driveways and streets and houses for miles around. The nightmare scenario is known as the China Syndrome. Land surrounding the plant will become uninhabitable. A study some years earlier has suggested upwards of 40,000 people could die if the China Syndrome becomes reality. That event was underway and the clock was now ticking. In December 1951, an experimental reactor in Idaho generated the first electric power from atoms, enough to light four bulbs. Inviting disaster will continue in a moment on the History Channel. We now return to Inviting Disaster on Modern Marvels. The worst thing that can happen with a high power complex machine is to have things start to go wrong and to not know as an operator what's happening or what you're supposed to do. March 28, 1979, 7.15 a.m. In a dozen communities surrounding the Three Mile Island plant, people are beginning their day. Commuters start the drive to Harrisburg. Shop owners prepare to open. Children begin heading for school. All are still unaware of the potential disaster that is building only a few miles away. At the Three Mile Island plant, a relief worker has finally discovered the stuck valve too late. The valve has been open for over two hours and a quarter of a million pounds of coolant have evaporated or leaked to the basement. But the leak had at least allowed some of the heat in the reactor to escape. Now some parts of the giant furnace are reaching 4,000 degrees, but the operators are unaware. Temperature monitoring instruments in the core can only read up to 700 degrees. The men sitting in the control room are now flying blind. Flying blind is really a scary, deeply unnerving experience, and it gets worse minute by minute. It's the feeling a person has that no one has ever been in this place before. You're on your own. That was the feeling that morning at Three Mile Island. Experts at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in Washington and Babcock and Wilcox, the designers of the reactor, desperately try to get through to the control room but the single phone line in the room is constantly tied up. The experts get only busy signals. As if the operators weren't already under enough pressure, a new alarm sounds. 
Radiation is now detected not only in the buildings, but in the control room as well. Step into what that control room must have been like. That one phone is ringing. Um, it's a constant blare. The master klaxon is going. Uh, the sounds of trouble. They are supposed to sit down and quietly work out these clues. It was just almost impossible. Radiation is measured in REMS. The maximum radiation a person should receive in a year is five REMS. Readings in the reactor containment building are now reaching 10,000 REMS. It is only a matter of time until this radiation leaks into the outside atmosphere. Gary Miller, the station manager for Three Mile Island, now declares a general state of emergency. The first ever in a nuclear power plant in the United States. Metropolitan Edison has been slow to release information about what is happening. But at 8.33, the story breaks. Radio station WKBO in Harrisburg is the first to tell the world. There is a general emergency at Metropolitan Edison Company's Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. A utility spokesman said... Word of the crisis is also finally reaching Pennsylvania Governor Dick Thornburg. His Lieutenant Governor, William Scranton, soon appears before the press. The Metropolitan Edison Company has informed us that there has been an incident at Three Mile Island, unit number two. Everything is under control. There is and was no danger to public health and safety. 10.17 a.m. Radiation levels at the top of the containment building could now kill a man in 20 seconds. Plant manager Miller now orders his men to break out emergency breathing apparatus. By 11 a.m., radiation is detected leaking into the atmosphere outside the plant. The evil genie is out of the bottle. By early afternoon, the press is all over the unfolding story of what is happening at Three Mile Island. Met Ed officials at last call a press conference of their own. Their spokesman is Jack Herbine, an engineer with no prior experience in dealing with the press. The incident occurred uh, this morning around 4 o'clock. Things are falling off right now. We expect soon to be in the, in the cold shutdown condition. Herbine says nothing about the escape of radioactivity into the air being breathed at that moment by the reporters. They are left with the impression that the incident is over. Basically, they just lied. They didn't call anyone, actually, for hours. And then they kept insisting that it was just a stuck valve and they would fix it and there was no real danger. Med Ed's uh, first pronouncements were extremely deceptive and disingenuous. In fact, it got to the point where the lieutenant governor actually had to give a press conference saying, look, the information the company is giving us is misleading and not credible. Med Ed was clearly failing in their efforts to contain the story. I don't know why we need to, we need to, to tell you each and everything that, that, that we do. They felt that, that they knew how to do, operate this, they knew you know, how to keep it under control, and, and there was a reluctance to admit that, that things were spiraling out of control. 7.33 p.m. The reactor designers at Babcock and Wilcox at last get a phone call through to the control room. The message is urgent and simple. Without water, the reactor will melt. Forget about going solid. Get water moving through the core. The pumps are finally restarted. And for the first time in 15 hours, the temperature and pressure in the reactor are at last stabilized. There will be no China syndrome. But the terrifying drama of this mighty machine is not yet over. The clock is still ticking. In 2000, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission began renewing permits for American nuclear reactors. The original permits were good for only 40 years of operation. Inviting disaster will continue in a moment on the History Channel. We now return to Inviting Disaster on Modern Marvels. In most cases, the mistakes made are ordinary ones. They are garden variety, the kind of mistakes that you have made, I have made. What is different about the machine frontier is that the consequences are extraordinary. Thursday, March 29th, 8.30 a.m. 
It is now 28 hours since the accident at Three Mile Island began. The men in the control room have no way of looking into the reactor, but it now seems clear that some of the 36,000 slender tubes holding the uranium fuel have cracked. This is allowing radioactivity to escape into the reactor coolant water. It is imperative operators know how much radioactivity is now in the coolant. Too much and the nuclear chain reaction could restart. Someone must enter the containment building to collect a sample. It is a task no one wants. But foreman Ed Hauser agrees to risk his life to take the readings. He goes in and takes his readings with his Geiger counter. Now, they say that uh, an X-ray is about 172nd thousandth of a rem. The med ed people had originally said that the amount of radiation that was being leaked was no more than you would get in an X-ray. When Hauser went in, he took his readings, he um, found that there were a thousand rems per hour bouncing off the walls inside the reactor three mile island. He is in for an even greater scare when he draws the coolant sample. The water from the reactor should be clear. Instead, he stares at a yellowish fizzing liquid that's giving off 1,250 rems of radiation. It actually vibrates in his hand. If he were foolish enough to continue holding it, the toxic beaker would kill him in less than half an hour. They knew they had a major problem. One thing is now clear to the operators at Three Mile Island and the advisors at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The reactor has sustained massive damage and still threatens the plant and the community. The public is not given these details. In fact, they have been given little information, but it is becoming clear to anyone living near Three Mile Island that something is very wrong with the nuclear plant they have been told was so safe. The worst thing about Three Mile Island is that people were running from something they couldn't see or feel or touch or hear. It's just this haunting, scary feeling of not knowing what you were exposed to. Pennsylvania Governor Richard Thornburg is given an optimistic assessment by MedEd officials, and based on their assurances, he calls a press conference. I believe at this point that there is no cause for alarm or any reason to disrupt your daily routine nor any reason to feel that public health has been affected by the events on Three Mile Island. But by evening, the amount of damage to the plant is becoming clearer. The basement is now filled with several hundred thousand gallons of radioactive water. This water continues to give off radioactive gas that is building up in the building. Operators realize that the gas cannot remain inside the plant. The order is given to vent the dangerous gas into the atmosphere. Governor Thornburg looks to officials at MedEd and the NRC for advice. But even the commissioner of the NRC in Washington, Joseph Hendry, struggles to feel in command of the conflicting information coming at him. There's a wonderful quote from Joseph Hendry to the then governor Thornburg that he felt, based on the information he was getting, that they were like two blind men making decisions in the dark. I mean, this is an incredible uh, incredibly disturbing phenomenon. People are making decisions about an, an extremely dangerous technological disaster based on misinformation, no information, or a lack of information. Long into the night, Thornburg and his staff continue to wrestle with the decision of whether to evacuate. A half million Pennsylvanians live within a strong breeze of the now dangerous nuclear plant. Their lives could hang in the balance. He wrestled with this because, as the record shows, his concern was that bad things happen during a, a chaotic evacuation. You know, people get killed in accidents, uh, you know, looting may go on, you know, that sort of thing. Thornburg knows a full evacuation will not be as easy as just reading an announcement. Roads will be jammed. And what about the disabled, hospital patients, the elderly, and people without a car? Nothing in his political career has prepared Thornburg for this situation. Friday, 8 a.m. In a suburb of Washington, D.C., 
members of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Incident Response Team meet with the Director of Regulation, Harold Denton. Denton is told that radiation levels inside Three Mile Island now require that they recommend preliminary evacuation to the governor. Put on your attention, please. There has been a state of emergency declared on Three Mile Island. Already, local authorities are warning the public. But finally, by late morning, Governor Thornburg becomes even more cautious. Based on advice of the chairman of the NRC, I am advising pregnant women and preschool aged children to leave the area within a five mile radius of the Three Mile Island facility until further notice. My sister was in school and parents just came and took their children out of school. There was that sense of panic, that sense of fear. Although Thornburg's evacuation order applies to only some 40,000 residents, over 100,000 people now take to the road. New York Times reporter Wilborn Hampton remembers driving through the small town of Goldsboro, just across the river from the stricken plant. It was like driving into a ghost town. The only thing that was missing were the tumbleweeds. It wasn't a car on the street. Drive by the post office, it's locked. Um, front doors standing open. Um, one house TV was still on. People had just gotten up and left as fast as they could. The fear that existed in the towns around Three Mile Island was very hard to describe. I'd never seen anything quite like it, and I had uh, covered uh, two or three wars. But it was, it was the fear of the unknown. Towns are being evacuated. Radioactive gases drift from the damaged reactor, and core temperatures are still off the chart. Radioactivity in the reactor containment building is so intense, insulation is burning off wiring, causing instruments to fail. Little by little, less and less will be known about the wounded but still very dangerous reactor. Now, an NRC engineer announces an even greater terror may be waiting to strike. By analyzing new computer data, Roger Matson is convinced that melting fuel rods have released a large amount of hydrogen that has now gathered at the top of the containment dome. With the right amount of oxygen, this hydrogen bubble can explode, instantly blowing the top off the building and filling the air for hundreds of miles with deadly radioactive gas. The world has never known a day quite like today. It faced the considerable uncertainties and dangers of the worst nuclear power plant accident of the atomic age. And the horror tonight is that it could get much worse. Reporters will come to call this day Black Friday. All who are near the stricken plant hold their breath to see what the next day will bring. We now return to Inviting Disaster on Modern Marvels. One thing we can be sure of now is that the public's trust can be lost rather quickly. One mistake, one irreversible consequence, the trust goes away and those people on the machine frontier might lose that spot forever. Saturday, 10 a.m. Reporters at Three Mile Island are now asking questions not to get a news story, but to have a sense of whether they should be running for their lives. From almost the moment the story reached them, the press has felt there was no one in authority they could trust. Met-Ed officials obviously are spinning the facts, and the NRC reactions are confused and contradictory. Among the people most concerned by the confusion is the President of the United States. Jimmy Carter is a trained engineer and a veteran of the Navy's illustrious nuclear submarine program. He now tells NRC Commissioner Joseph Hendry that he wants a personal representative at Three Mile Island to take charge of activities and report directly to him. Hendry turns to Harold Denton. Denton is an engineer who has been leading the emergency team at NRC headquarters in Bethesda, Maryland. Now he arrives in Pennsylvania with presidential authority. Almost immediately, the mood begins to change. Harold Denton uh, of the NRC was uh, was sent in to be kind of like the reassuring public figure who could give out the information and have people actually believe him. When Harold Denton arrived, 
there suddenly was a sense that here was someone you could trust. And it was a great relief after days of talking to publicists and press people from Metropolitan Medicine. I am advising those who may be particularly susceptible. Thornburg had ordered the evacuation of pregnant women and children. Now, if Roger Matson's warning about the danger of the hydrogen bubble is correct, every resident in a 10-mile radius should be evacuated. The problems of such a task would be extraordinary. But so would the loss of life if the governor makes a mistake. Governor Thornburg was faced with a difficult situation. I wouldn't have wanted to be in his shoes for, for the world. Harold Denton has looked carefully at the data and talked to other engineers about the hydrogen bubble and the immediate danger of meltdown. He is more confident about the situation than Roger Matson. Governor Thornburg decides to gamble on Denton's opinion. But it's certainly days before uh, flammability limits would be reached and many more days after that before detonation limits would be reached all of which assume that we did nothing but sit on our hands here instead of uh, getting the hydrogen out of the vessel at the same press conference the governor makes a shocking announcement one that will do much to at last end many people's fears president carter will be paying a visit to the area make a personal on-site visit. But what most of America does not understand is that there is still strong disagreement within the NRC as to whether the hydrogen bubble is close to blowing the roof off the containment building, perhaps with the president inside. The president did take a chance by coming. But he had advice from some of his, his people that he really shouldn't go, that it was still not safe enough for the president of the United States to, to go there. But he was a nuclear engineer. He knew probably better than, than any other public elected official you know, what was going on, what the dangers were. Sunday, April 1st, 10 a.m. Even as the president's helicopter comes in for a landing in Harrisburg, Matson and Victor Stello, another NRC engineer, are locked in a heated dispute over the threat of the hydrogen bubble. Harold Denton briefs the president and Mrs. Carter on the situation. He is very direct and tells the president of the dispute between his staff as to the present danger at the plant. Carter doesn't hesitate. He starts downriver toward Three Mile Island. The president tours the plant. The tour does not uncover any new facts for the president's consideration or the public's consumption. Its purpose is simple, restore public confidence. When the president came uh, along with his wife, we felt that uh, the president of the United States is not going to come if it's not safe. And when he came, it was, uh, it really was a relief as far as the people were concerned. But the important moment of Carter's visit is not taking place with the president inside the plant, but in an office trailer where Roger Matson and Victor Stella frantically analyze chemical calculations together. As the president's visit is concluding, Stella at last finds the error in the calculations that proves his point. They do have time, days, perhaps weeks. The hydrogen can be released gradually, ending the danger of a massive explosion. And finally, engineers will be able to slowly shut down the reactor. The end of the crisis is in sight. Disaster was averted at Three Mile Island. But the scale of what might have been is difficult for most people to imagine. Yes, there was talk of radioactivity and some sort of meltdown. And a few thousand people were temporarily forced from their homes, but no one died. To anyone living in another part of America, not much seems to have happened. To begin to comprehend what almost happened on a small island in the Susquehanna River, it is necessary to look at another nuclear power plant half a world away. Before nuclear power, uranium had little value, and then only as a coloring agent for porcelain and glass. Inviting disaster will continue in a moment on the History Channel. We now return to Inviting Disaster on Modern Marvels. The history of machines tells us that the most likely time for a problem, for error, for a malfunction, is when a big, complex machine is moving from one state to another. It is 
uh, changing its speed. It is being started up. It is being shut down. It is an airplane that is landing. Those are changes of state that need a, a higher than normal uh, level of alertness. Like Three Mile Island, the Chernobyl nuclear plant sits on a riverbank. This one is the Pripyat River, 80 miles north of the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv. Seven years earlier, catastrophe had been narrowly averted at Three Mile Island. But on a spring day in 1986, the farm-filled countryside around this huge plant will not be so lucky. Unit 4 at Chernobyl had been scheduled for a maintenance shutdown. Even routine maintenance moves a complex machine from one state to another. It is a time of great danger. Normal procedure is interrupted or set aside. Safety checklists are changed. But on this day, authorities have changed the status quo even more. They have ordered that a test be conducted to see how much electricity can be pulled from the generators while the reactor is losing power and slowing to a halt. The thing was hard to keep going at low power. And one by one, they had to disable the various automatic systems that would have shut down the reactor. This big grumpy beast did not like to keep walking at this awkward speed. In fact, the reactor fought back tried to shut itself down completely as it approached that dangerous low power state, the operators took steps to keep it running at a lower power, pushing that edge because they had been told, um, work out this experiment, see how much power you can squeeze. Now the reactor is surging into unknown territory. Within minutes, it is clear to plant operators that the machine is running away with itself they decide to shut it down. And they threw the switch to drive in the control rods, which were also the shutdown rods. And unfortunately, the design of those rods had the effect of making the situation worse instead of better. With a force of 45 tons of dynamite, the reactor explodes and rips off the top of the containment building. Tons of steel are thrown in all directions. But what was also blown apart was one of the largest collections of cancer-causing, death-causing poison that humans had ever assembled in one place. As helicopters and plant workers pour tons of water onto the raging inferno, huge clouds of radioactive steam pour into the air. They begin a terrifying migration across all of Northern Europe. In what amounts to a suicide mission, Workers frantically try to bring the fire under control. While Soviet media try to put the best face on the disaster, the awful results soon become apparent. Over 2,000 workers die in the initial explosion and the intense radiation that follows. Another 6,000 will die when they are ordered to build a containment shell over the ruined but still very deadly reactor. I have a great deal of respect to those people who were going inside the shelter. They knew that there was a 90% probability that they would die of radiation eventually. And yet... <laughs> I'm sorry, kid. I am sure that most of them died. The nearby city of Pripyat, once home to 50,000 people, became a ghost town as its residents were evacuated from the region. In the years since, cancer rates and birth defects throughout the Ukraine and neighboring Belarus have skyrocketed. Today, the containment shell that was poorly built in haste around the still radioactive plant threatens to collapse. If it does, it will again spill its poison into the environment. Some of the statistics are really fr frightening. No one will ever farm within probably a hundred mile radius of that place for decades, perhaps a hundred years. If you have to doubt that attention must be paid to these things, just look at some of the incidents and statistics from Chernobyl. So it gives a glimpse, just a glimpse, a horrific glimpse, of what 
could have happened in Pennsylvania. Three Mile Island was spared the horror of Chernobyl. The great cooling towers of Unit 2 still rise to the sky. But the unit has never again produced electricity. Radiation levels in some parts of its buildings remain so high that no one has dared go there since the accident. In July of 1983, technicians at last were able to lower video cameras into the core of the reactor. What they found confirmed what had only been feared. Over 50% of the reactor's core had vanished on that day in 1979, turning over 20 tons of uranium into molten sludge. 30 to 60 minutes is all that separated Three Mile Island from the unspeakable. Had complete reactor meltdown occurred, as many as 3,000 people might have died immediately. Another 45,000 could have died from radiation cancer. Harrisburg, Lancaster, even the Gettysburg National Battlefield Park, all could have become uninhabitable for decades. But fortunately, no one died at Three Mile Island. Ultimately, the physical plant did its job. Most radiation was contained. The meltdown was only partial. Although Unit 2 remains locked and impossible to enter for more than a few minutes, its companion, Unit 1, continues to produce electricity. But five frightening days in the spring of 1979 changed forever the face of nuclear power in America. They ended the nation's blind infatuation with the atomic miracle. Since the accident, no new reactor licenses have been applied for. Because of Three Mile Island, nuclear plants today are safer, better equipped, and are operated by personnel better trained to handle emergencies. Carefully designed evacuation and contingency plans are in place. Most important, no one involved in nuclear power will ever again tell the public, it can't happen here. Some of the most dramatic changes have been in how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is prepared to deal with any future accidents. I'd like to show you the facility that we developed that reflects many of the lessons learned as a result of the Three Mile Island accident. Of most importance is a direct line that we have from here to every plant site in the United States. It not only ties in voice communication links and allows these individuals to talk to their counterparts on site, but it also has a line that goes into the plant computer. What we do with that information is analyze it, turn it over, and attempt to characterize what are the most important parts of the safety systems that we should be concerned with. But we have also learned other, less tangible lessons. They are lessons that have less to do with hardware and engineering and more to do with human attitudes toward technology. Well, complex technologies work best when they're backed up by skepticism and checking, not bravado, not confidence that nothing can go wrong. Complacency and bravado are recipes for surprises and very nasty surprises. As our technologies advance and as our power to wipe ourselves out increases, it is vital that our wisdom increase at at least as fast a rate as our knowledge and wisdom and knowledge are not the same things. You know, I think it's important that these cooling towers remain here forever as a uh, monument to a failed technology. And, you know, like any battlefield that you go to study, this is a battlefield where technology failed. And you can't study nuclear power without coming to Three Mile Island. It would be like studying the Civil War without going to Gettysburg. Of the 37,000 people who lived within five miles of these giant towers when the accident happened, only half remain living there. Those who stayed here express a confidence that society has learned well the lessons of Three Mile Island. Those who have moved away from this place remind us that we must forever be on guard for the mistakes and arrogance that can bring about disaster. This book is...